Okay, so uh, NMR. NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. Nuclear magnetic resonance. Now, an MRI is actually an NMR. So MRIs, if you guys have ever had an MRI, MRI, the M and the R is the same as the M and R, the M and R and NMR. Magnetic resonance with the I stands for imagery. Okay? Um, MRIs were NMRs. Back in the 60s when all the technology all came out and they started doing MRIs, they actually called them NMRs. So a doctor would say, you need to go get an NMR done. But this word nuclear in it may freak people out because this was towards the, uh, like the Cold War era where um, with Russia and nuclear bombs and anytime you heard the word nuclear, you thought of a nuclear bomb. Uh, in this case, this has nothing to do with a nuclear bomb. This is just the nucleus of, uh, of an atom is basically all this refers to. So in order to start selling this product and have doctors using it, they changed it, the name of it to call it MMR. M N M R I is to get rid of this word, word nuclear, but it's basically the same exact thing. Okay, uh, I'm going to give you a real quick uh, uh, physics theory as to how this works. Uh, if you remember in the IR case, I gave you a physics theory where you send in IR pulses and and it activates the bonds um, with the functional group. So if you have a carbonyl, uh, the wavelengths in the 1750 range were the ones that, that were being absorbed. And the IR recognize that those wavelengths aren't passing through. They're being absorbed. So it, it, it showed that to you. That's basically what we do with an NMR. Okay. This happens to do with nuclear spins. It's the spin of the nucleus. All right. And we're going to be using radio waves. In fact, it uses the, uh, the, the lowest form of wavelength of energy. IRs even use higher energy sources of this. This uses the lowest energy. So again, people were freaked out by this word, but it was the lowest forms of energy. Okay, so it's the nuclear spin. Our nuclear, and in particular, we're talking about the hydrogens, all of the hydrogens on a molecule. And what NMR does, the difference between an NMR and IR, IR gives you the functional groups. This is going to tell you where the hydrogens are on your molecule. It gives you a backbone of the molecule. So NMR, it just tells you if you have aliphatic. This is going to tell you if you have a methyl group, an ethyl group, an isopropyl group, if you have a tert-butyl group, if you have an oxygen next door like to a CH2 group that's attached to a CH3 group. So this gives you basically the structure of the molecule. Okay, so this is very, very powerful. Once this came out in the 60s, um, really, uh, IR came out like in the 20s, but once NMR came out, um, they knew the theory back in the 20s, but they didn't have the technology in order to build one of these. Um, but since, but when the technology got advanced enough in the 60s and when these started coming out, this was very powerful. Okay, so basically th this is how it works. The nuclear spins of hydrogens are random. That means if you take a sample of hydrogen or a molecule, all of the spins of the nucleus in, in the hydrogen are random. All right, I'm going to show it with an arrow. So it might be a spin up or, or the spins are sideways or spins are th this way. So these hydrogens are like tops on a molecule, like a spinning top. And all of these spins, these are the, the, the nucleus, nuclear spins of an atom, okay, are randomly spinning in a different order, okay? <clears throat> uh, if you've ever had an MRI, basically it's a big magnet, okay? So we'll, we'll talk about what the magnet does. Now, if you took these nuclear spins, now anytime you have a, an electrical charge that is moving, they create a magnetic field. So, so um, uh, if you have charge and movement, all right, this is what a magnet, you can form a magnet. Okay, if you ever had a physics class, if you ever done the classic experiment where you, um, you, if you take uh, a piece of iron and you wrap uh, copper metal around the nail, so a nail, so I, I used to do it with a nail, and you wrap it with uh, copper wire, and if you attach that copper wire in a battery, that nail becomes magnetic. That's what's called an electromagnetic uh, magnet. I remember I did it in grade school. I don't know if you guys have ever done that experiment. 
but electricity and magnetism go hand in hand. All right, the way that we get electricity in our house is at the, uh, at the plant. They have a big magnet that is in the middle of a coil of copper wire and they spin that magnet very fast, causes the electrons in the copper wire to actually move. And that's what electricity is. It's the movement of electrons. That's how it works. Now, the spinning of the magnet takes a lot of energy. So how do you do it? Do you do it with nuclear power? What nuclear power is, is you have, uh, it splits the atom, it creates a lot of heat, it boils water, the steam f f f from the water spins that magnet. So that's a nuclear power plant, how a nuclear power plant basically works. The nuclear part doesn't create the electricity, it creates heat, which boils water, turns it to steam, the steam then spins that magnet and you have electricity. Um, at a hydro plant, like a waterfall, the the falling water, that energy is so uh, great and the water is falling so fast that they put it in a tube and that spins a magnet and creates a electricity. So these are different ways of how you spin the magnet. Um, wind power should be kind of obvious. The wind spins a turbine and guess what the turbine is spinning? It's spinning the magnet, which is inside of a coil of copper wire. So all these are different forms of energy to cause a magnet to actually spin. Okay, uh, my uh, I actually had a, uh, a a friend of my father's was an electrical engineer, and uh, what he created was he told his kids if you want to watch television, all right, you have to do exercise. So what he did is he hooked up a bicycle like to a power source that powers a television and basically it was a battery that gets charged up so he said that you have to ride the bicycle and the spinning of the wheels of the bicycle make the magnet spin which it creates electricity that charges its battery which now you can use the battery and watch the television so all depending on how much energy you put in how long you ride that bike charges a battery it will, it will give you a certain amount of time on the television. I thought that was brilliant, but I think I thought he should have like all patented that and uh, sell it to, to parents who are trying to get their kids to exercise to watch TV. Uh, but the, so that was the power source of the electricity was in the bicycle. I always thought that if you attach all the bicycles and the treadmills and the and the climbers at a uh, at a um, uh, at a gym and hooked it up into a power source and actually took that energy of people and charged up a battery in order to, um, uh, in order to, in order to light up the place. I thought that would be a great way to actually like to save energy. Um, the problem is what Jade said. I thought uh, about that tool. Yeah. Um, the problem though, is that I guess it, it, you know, it turns out that human power is actually very small amount of energy in compared to how much energy it takes in order to create electricity. Um, so anyway, sorry I went on that side note. That was more of, of, of the physics that you don't need to know, but it's it's still interesting. Okay, so anyways, we have our nuclear spins. So anytime you have a charged particle and a magnet, you can have electricity. Where's Kelly? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I think the cost of getting that hooked up is way more than what you would get out of it. And that's that's probably why people don't do it. I'm sure other people have thought of that idea. But I think the cost of doing it is too expensive. Okay, so anyways, what happens is you take this molecule that has all the nuclear spins randomly spinning and you put it in an external magnetic field. And in physics, this is kind of how they show a magnetic field with a big arrow and a B naught. I don't know why it's B. I can't remember what it means. And basically what it does is these uh, nuclear spins align with the magnetic field. If anyone has ever had an MRI, what they do is they put you on a table and they slide you into the magnet. That big old, old tunnel thing is a gigantic magnet. When they turn the magnetic on, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, for, for, for those who have ever had an MRI, I've, I've had it once, you kind of feel a little weird. All right. Now, the magnet in the MRI is tuned to the hydrogens in, your in all the water molecules in your body. So what happens is all of the water molecules normally are randomly spinning in your body. As soon as you go in the magnet, every nuclear spin in your water molecules all of a sudden align in the same way as the magnetic field. That's not a natural state. It actually makes you feel a little weird. It makes your hair stand up. It makes you have a little bit of 
a tingling sensation um, uh, in your body. Uh, Anna said, I had one. It sucks. The football helmet is the weirdest part. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So what happens is, is it aligns all your, all your water molecules in your body all the same direction. Um, so it's a very a, 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 a bizarre thing to happen. But for a regular NMR, for normal molecules, that's what basically happens. All of the nuclear spins uh, on every hydrogen on your molecule. So let's just take a random molecule, CH3, CH2, O, CH3. All right, you've got eight different hydrogens on this molecule. They all have a different spin, nuclear spin in random order. But as soon as you put it in the magnetic field, every nuclear spin is being aligned with our magnet. Then what you do is you pulse in radio waves, all right, which is the lowest energy. Let's just put in green, whatever. And here's the energy of the radio waves is going in. And depending on how strongly these uh, spins are attracted to our external magnetic field, some of them are have, have a much stronger effect of the ex external magnetic field. Other ones don't have as strong as a, as an effect on the magnetic field. We'll talk about how you know which ones those are. So all depending on the wavelength of radio waves, it will flip the nuclear spin. So maybe a low amount of energy flips that uh, spin there. So I still have my external magnetic field, and maybe all depending on the energy I have, only this one is flipped, okay? And then, what happens is it flips back down, all right? It flips back down and that energy is released and I have a, a detector that says this hydrogen, whatever hydrogen it is, maybe it's the hydrogen on the CH3, absorbed the energy at that wavelength and it shows up on the NMR. And then this hydrogen is a different molecule. It takes a different energy wavelength in order to flip that. And then that energy wavelength is showed on the NMR so it tells me it's that kind of hydrogen and so forth and so on. So it's kind of like the IR, depending on the wavelength, tells me information about the functional group. Here, it's specific hydrogens it's telling me about. So it's the same kind of analogy, um, uh, except we are looking at hydrogens, we're not looking at functional groups. So it's much more specific. Okay, so that's basically how it works. And the does that make sense? It's kind of a quick version of it. There's a lot of other physics to it. If there was a physicist in here, they'd probably just shake their head and say, are you kidding me? That's all you're telling them? Yes, that's all I'm telling you. All right, the scale goes from 0 to 10. Actually, it, it goes to 2. I'm sorry, it goes to 12, but 12 is very uncommon. Uh, only one group, sh only one, one type of hydrogen shows up at uh, up to 12. Okay, but usually the NMR is between... Uh, there's Kelly. We're just talking about you. It goes from 0 up to 10. Okay, and all depending on the wavelength. So maybe I have a, uh, one of the radio waves uh, absorbs here, another one absorbs here, and then maybe I have another one that absorbs here. It's all depending on how strongly attracted the hydrogens are to the magnetic field. It's going to take more energy in order to flip it. Okay, so, uh, so if it takes less energy, all right, then one of the hydrogens will flip, and that shows up on my NMR. Okay, if it takes more energy, all right, then it's going to show up at a different place on the NMR. And that's basically how it works. It's how strongly it's attracted. Okay, um, just to give you uh, some terms, as you go closer, like to zero, this is called upfield. And as you go to, as you go this way towards the left, this is downfield. I'm sorry, downfield. Okay, so I, it's kind of. Um, uh, yes. So downfield, you know, it's kind of opposite. A lot of people would think, well, as you're increasing numbers, shouldn't that be called upfield? Eh, well, it's not. Okay. So upfield is closer to the zero area. Downfield is more to the left. Okay. So that's a, a basic scale. Um, just to kind of show you an NMR. Here's kind of an NMR. You have zero. Uh, this one stops at eight, but it's usually up to 10. And then you have peaks at certain areas on the NMR. Okay? So I just kind of want to give you that. 
Okay, so any questions on the theory? I'm not going to ask you any questions on the theory, but I think kind of having a general idea as to what these peaks are telling you. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is something called shielding. Okay. Shielding. This is the amount of electron density around the nucleus. All right? So I have a nucleus and I have the electrons around it. Now some molecules I have a lot of electron density around it. A lot of electron density. This is relatively shielded. Okay? My new so Remember, this is all about the nucleus. It's not about the electrons. It's about our nuclear spin. So this is shielded from the external magnetic field. Here's my external magnetic field. All right. This nuclear spin is shielded from the magnetic field by the electron. So the magnetic field doesn't have a strong effect on the magnetism of my nucleus. So it's going to take less energy in order to flip these nu this nucleus. All right, obviously, if I had a really strong magnetic field, it takes a lot of energy to actually break that ma magnetism apart and flip our nucleus. But if it's relatively shielded, all right, if this, if this magnetic field is shielded from the nucleus by the amount of electrons, all right, it's shielded. So it has a, a, a this magnetic field has a weaker attraction of my nucleus. And then obviously, if something is deshielded, it's the exact opposite. I have a nucleus. I have a little bit of electron density around my nucleus. Okay, I don't have as much electrons around here, so this nuclear spin is not shielded that much by my external magnetic field. So obviously it's going to take more energy to actually flip this because this is attracted really strong to the magnetic field. It's going to take more energy in order to flip that nuclear spin from the radio waves. So it's going to take higher energy radio waves in order to do that. So this is more de-shielded or less shielded. Okay, so the question is how do you know if the hydrogen, remember, we're only talking about hydrogens. If a hydrogen, so how do you know if a hydrogen is shielded or deshielded? What do you guys think? You guys know the answer. You just don't know that you know the answer. Okay, how do you know if a hydrogen is more shielded or deshielded? Let's take this molecule here. You can look at a molecule and you can figure this out. So we're looking at electron density. Um, how does a atom have more electrons around it versus an atom that has less electrons around it? What's the term or the theory? Uh, not lone pairs. That's a good guess. That's a good guess. It's not lone pairs. But how do you know if something... So I'll give you a hint. If something is more partially positively charged, do you think that's more shielded or more de-shielded? If something has a partial positive charge on it, just put a D for de-shielded or S for shielded. Uh, more shielded, so we're talking about the electron density. If something has more of a positive charge, it has less electrons around it, right? That's why it has this positive charge. The electrons are being pulled away from it, all right? So if I have like a carbon attached to like a fluorine, this is partial negative, right? This carbon, the electron density is being drawn away by the fluorine, right? So this is more electropositive, so this is gonna be more de-shielded, less electron density around us. That, that's the whole point of electronegativities and bond polarity. So the fluorine is gonna be more what? The fluorine will be more shielded because the electrons, much more electrons, let's do it in green, much more electron density around my fluorine, little bit of electron density around my carbon. So this goes to the difference in the electronegativities and bond polarities. 
that make sense? So by looking at a molecule, now what we're looking at are the hydrogens. We're, we're not looking at carbons and oxygens. I just want to make sure uh, that, that you guys re remember bond polarities and how now shielding and deshielding affect that. So the more partial positive, the more deshielded. So in this case, deshielded. In this case, obviously it's more shielded. Okay, this is where we have a partial positive. This is where we'll have a partial negative. Okay. So basically, the closer a hydrogen is to an electronegative atom, okay, so the closer a hydrogen is to an electronegative atom, the more what? The more shielded or the more deshielded? The closer a hydrogen is to an electronegative atom, the more S shielded or put D for deshielded. Which one? So if hydrogen is close to a very electronegative atom, is the hydrogen going to be more positively charged, more negatively charged? All right, so I got shielded, deshielded, shielded. Okay, we're still not understanding it. If I have a hydrogen and it's attached to a fluorine, okay, fluorine is more electronegative. Okay, what's the fluorine going to do? Is it pulling the electrons away from it or is it pumping electrons to it? What's the fluorine doing? Pulling electrons away. So P for pulling or put it, you know, or it's going in. All right, so fluorine is more electronegative. So this has a partial negative charge. What does that mean? That means the fluorines are pulling electrons away from my hydrogen. So hydrogen does not have a lot of electrons around it. It looks like this. Because fluorine is more electronegative. This is much more partial positive. So if hydrogen is closer to an electronegative atom, the hydrogen is more deshielded. The electrons are being pulled away. The nucleus of hydrogen is exposed. It's more exposed because I don't have electron density around it. Okay? I wonder if people are making this harder th than it is. All right? Just kind of think to yourself. Are electrons around it or electrons being pulled away from it okay so that so that so the closer a hydrogen is to an electronegative atom the more deshielded it is it's being pulled away all right so we're going to look at the hydrogens in this molecule so you have to go back to remembering is the bond polar or is a bond nonpolar. So you look at the atoms it's attached to. Okay, so these hydrogens right here, all right, let's talk about these hydrogens. Let's talk about hydrogens A. These hydrogens, okay, don't worry about the carbon. How I'm going to say it is these hydrogens are directly next door to an oxygen. I mean, in reality, it's attached to a carbon that's attached to an oxygen, but I, I look to see, I kind of ignore all of the carbons here because uh, proton NMR just looks at the hydrogens, okay? So these hydrogens are next door to an oxygen. Is, is oxygen more electronegative than hydrogen? All right, the answer is yes. So therefore, these hydrogens are going to be a little bit deshielded. Okay, because the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon that it's attached to. So since oxygen pulls electrons away from carbon, it's going to pull electrons away from the hydrogen. All right, so the electron density is being pulled towards the oxygen, deshielding the hydrogens. The electrons around the hydrogens are being sucked away from it. All right, what about these hydrogens? All right, these hydrogens, again, are directly next door to an oxygen. So these hydrogens are gonna be relatively deshielded because they're next door to an oxygen. All right, now these hydrogens, all right, what, what we wanna look at is the bond between the carbon and the carbon, what kind of bond is that? Polar or nonpolar? All right, that is a nonpolar bond. Right, I uh, assume you, N, Anna, you meant nonpolar. So, yes, yep, okay. So, nonpolar, therefore, are these electrons gonna be, are the, are the electrons gonna be pulled away from these hydrogens, or is there no effect? So the answer is there's no effect. So, these hydrogens are more shielded because it's attached, because I have a nonpolar bond here this carbon is not pulling electrons away from these hydrogens. 
Okay, so if you have a nonpolar bond, the hydrogens are going to be shielded. If you have a polar bond, they're going to be more deshielded. Okay, so why don't we just do some quick problems here? Okay, uh, let's put that attached to a nitrogen. Let's do this attached to carbon. Uh, here, let's put the, I'll get CH3. Tell you what, let's just do this. Let's do this. H, and yeah, let's do one more. Um, okay, so let's start over here, all right? Let's look at this hydrogen right here, all right? You think that hydrogen will be considered deshielded or shielded? All right, and it says deshielded. And when Morgan says deshielded, Ashley says deshielded. Anybody want to say anything else? You have a 50 50 chance, right? Jacob says shielded. Okay, so again, what we want to do is look at the carbon that the hydrogen's attached to and determine is this attached to a polar bond? Is there a polar bond somewhere? Well, the carbon hydrogen is nonpolar, this is nonpolar, but this nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, therefore these hydrogens are going to be deshielded. All right. Now, there is an extent of deshielding. There's really deshielded, then there's a slightly deshielded. In this case, since nitrogen is not very electronegative, uh, uh, like compared to carbon, it's right next door, it's going to be slightly deshielded. All right, but we don't have to worry about the amount yet. I just want to make sure you understand if you're next to something more electronegative, it's going to be a little bit more deshielded. I just want you to understand this concept of deshielding. Okay, how about these hydrogens on the nitrogen? Deshielded or shielded? All right, Anna says deshielded. That's correct. In fact, they are way more deshielded than these. Why would a hydrogen directly attached to a nitrogen be more deshielded than a hydrogen attached to a carbon attached to a nitrogen? Well, it's kind of obvious. This is directly attached to the nitrogen. This is two atoms away from it. So the atom still has a slight effect on these hydrogens, but this hydrogen is directly attached to it. So it's going to be much more deshielded. That's kind of why I put a bigger D versus smaller D. Okay. Now this molecule... All of the hydrogens in this case are shielded, right? Because everything is a nonpolar bond. So these are all shielded hydrogen. There's not a single deshielded hydrogen on that molecule. All right. Now, what about hydrogen A? And then we'll call the hydrogen here hydrogen B. Hydrogen A, would you say shielded or deshielded? Put S or D for hydrogen A. Shielded or deshielded? Yep, deshielded, exactly. Because it's because it's attached, it's next door to an electronegative atom. All right, what about this hydrogen right here? Shielded or deshielded? Shielded, correct, because it's attached to carbons and hydrogens. All right, this oxygen is way too far away to have an effect on this hydrogen. It's really the atom next door. If I had like a nitrogen here in pyridine, then we would be a, a little bit more deshielded. All right, but if it's just all carbons and hydrogens, we'll get rid of that. It's going to be relatively shielded. Okay, now if we look at our scale, now that we know shielding and deshielding, well, what does that mean? How, how, how do I use that on the scale? Well, remember, this is downfield, and this is upfield. And it's not a number, all right? It's not like, well, it's zero, it's upfield, but what, what if it's five? Okay. This upfield and downfield is relative of each other. So, uh, like, for example, it, it, if I have a peak here at 1 and a peak here at 3, the peak at 3 is more downfield than the peak at 1. That's how these terms are used. It's really, if something is more to the left, it, it doesn't matter where it is on the scale. If it's more to the left of something else, we call it downfield. If it's more to the right, we call it upfield. So the peak at 1 is more upfield than the peak at 3. 
Okay. Obviously, if I have a peak at 9, then I say the peak at 9 is more downfield than the peaks at 3 and 1. The peak at 3 is more downfield than the peak at 1, or it's more upfield than the peak at 9. So that, that's how these terms are used. It's relative of other peaks. Okay. Now, your peaks, the, the more you go downfield, the more de-shielded that hydrogen is. All right, so I remember D goes with D. All right, the further left you go, the more de-shielded your hydrogens. The further right you go, the more shielded. All right, so this peak at one is more shielded than the peaks at three. And the peak at three is more shielded than the peak at nine. Okay? That's kind of how you look at this. All right, so let's say I had, um, let's say I had this molecule, CH3, CH2, let's say OH. Okay. Now, uh, the hydrogens on alcohols sometimes don't show up. Uh, kind of the same reason as in IR. So you remember IR? Acid peaks are very broad. Uh, I, I never told you why they were very broad. Uh, usually in classes I do, but since we're doing very quickly, I didn't have time to. But it's basically because of hydrogen bonding, that hydrogen is, is going on and off of the molecule. So it's like if you take a picture. Imagine you take a picture and everybody moves right when you take the picture. What's the picture going to look like? All right, It's going to be all blurry and smeared. Because it's taking an average of what everybody is doing. Okay, that's kind of what's happening with these very um, uh, acidic hydrogens or these hydrogens that have a lot of hydrogen bonding. Because of the fact that they are exchanging on and off and you're forming hydrogen bonds, the IR and the NMR are taking an average of where this hydrogen's energy is, and it, and it's over a large area. So that's why these peaks are usually very broad or very hard to see especially in the in the NMR, okay? So what I'm going to do is on this NMR, I'm just going to graph this hydrogen and this hydrogen. So hydrogen A and hydrogen B. I'm not going to worry about the hydrogen on the alcohol. And let's say I have a peak here and I have a peak here, all right? So let's look at this first peak, all right? If I knew that th this is my molecule and here's the NMR of the molecule, it doesn't really matter what numbers, right? Which hydrogen does this peak represent? The A hydrogens or the B hydrogens? Based off of what we've talked about, shielding, de-shielding, upfield, downfield. Notice I have two peaks. One is A and one is B. What does this one? Everyone is saying A. That is absolutely correct. That would be for hydrogen A, and what would this one be? Obviously, it'd be B. Okay? The closer you are to zero, the more upfield, the more shielded your hydrogens. Why is this hydrogen shielded again? Because we have a nonpolar bond between the hydrogen that the carbon is on, that we're talking about, and the carbon next door to it. So these are more shielded. This is less shielded, more de-shielded, because it's next door to the oxygen. The oxygen is more electronegative. It's withdrawing electrons from the hydrogen, making them more de-shielded. So therefore, that's going to be more downfield or more to the left. So these hydrogens are more downfield. It's going to take more energy to flip these because, these, because the electrons are not shielding them as much. So the magnetic field holds on to them stronger. Okay, so that's how you use the shielding, de-shielding. By looking at where these peaks are from each other, and by looking at your molecule, you can usually figure out which hydrogens represent uh, which one on your molecule based off of just looking at the other atoms on the molecule. Okay. Now, if I had a molecule like this, all right, CH3, CH2, CH3, basically they're all shielded, but they aren't the same types of hydrogens. I'll probably see a whole bunch of peaks on top of each other. So I might see a peak there and maybe another peak like right there, all right, very close of each other. These are not equivalent hydrogens. I'm going to talk about equivalent hydrogens next, but I want to make sure you guys understand the shielding and de-shielding first. 
Okay, so basically, if the hydrogens are next door to an electronegative atom, it's more de-shielded. If they are not next door to an electronegative atom, they're more shielded. Okay, so if I have like a CH3, CH2, 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 OH, all right, these will be very de-shielded, and then the rest of them pretty much are relatively shielded. Okay, and the NMR of that would probably be, you'd have a nice peak here, and then a whole bunch of peaks all right on, on, on top of each other. It would be a mess in that region there. I guess we would have these hydrogens, these hydrogens, these hydrogens, and these hydrogens. Questions. A lot of a lot of theory. Okay, now let's talk about chemical equivalence. Okay, another way of talking about this is the number of different hydrogens, or you might say, how many different peaks will you see on the NMR? Number of NMR peaks. Okay, so let's talk about equivalence here. The NMR, you gotta remember, is just a machine. It does not have a brain. It just does what it's programmed to actually do. So let's take this molecule. Okay, so remember, the NMR sends in radio waves, waves of energy, and the hydrogens absorb whatever wavelength that hydrogen is supposed to absorb, okay? That's all it knows how to do. All right, let's look at this carbon here, carbon one. We've got three different hydrogens. These hydrogens are on the same exact carbon. So they are said to be called in the same environment, okay? Or they are chemically equivalent. Environment is the other one. Chemical environment. All right, these all mean the same thing. All four of these, I might say chemical equivalence, chemical environment, the number of different hydrogens, the number of peaks. I'm, I, I, really right now, I'll, I'll probably call it environment and equivalence. Okay, these hydrogens are equal. The NMR can't distinguish between this hydrogen, this hydrogen, or this hydrogen because they absorb the exact wavelength of energy because they're in the same environment on the molecule. They are, all three hydrogens are on a carbon that's next door to an oxygen that has a CH2 and a CH3 on it. Okay, so does that make sense? So if I write it as CH3, you know, I'm going to write it like this, and CH2 and CH3, it's the same way of doing it. All three of these hydrogens are in the same environment. I will only see one different peak for all three of these hydrogens. So, I, so it's not like I'm going to see a peak for this hydrogen and a different peak for this hydrogen and a different peak for that one. All three of them are the are in the exact same location because they are chemically equivalent or they're the, in the same environment. So they absorb the same wavelengths of energy. Make sense? All right. And then these two hydrogens are in their own different chemical equivalents because these, there are only two of them. All right. Here I have three that's next to an oxygen. Here there are two that are next to an oxygen, but they're also next to another thing, a CH3 group. So they're not really exactly in the same environment of these hydrogens. They're close because it's next to an oxygen, but they also have these three hydrogens next door to it that these blue hydrogens do not. So it changes the environment that these two hydrogens are in. So these two hydrogens are equivalent to each other, meaning I'll only see one peak for both of these hydrogens, but they're a different environment than these three hydrogens. Now, they might be near each other on the NMR. I might have, let's say, zero and 10, all right? And I might have the blue peak might be, let's say, around here, you know, and then the purple ones might be, I don't know, maybe somewhere around here, okay? Now, what we'll also learn, I'll just tell you right now quickly, is the integration. Uh, the height of the peak will tell you how many hydrogens there are in that area. So obviously this bigger peak implies the three hydrogens. This purple one is, is two thirds the height of this one. Why is it two thirds? Because it's a two to three ratio. So it's two thirds as high. 
So that purple one will be two thirds as high. Okay, so integration, I don't want to spend a whole other uh, uh, um, like thing on that because our, our time is, is, uh, is constrained. But, but basically the height of our peak will also tell me how many hydrogens there are. Um, what I'll clearly do is I'll actually ha have a number here. I'll put a three there and I'll put a two here. So it's pretty obvious. The, th this peak is for these hydrogens because there's two in that environment. And the blue one, there are three in that environment. Now let's look at the green ones. A lot of people might say, well, these three looks just like a CH3 here. So won't they be the exact same environment? No, because these three are next to an oxygen. These three are next to a CH2. So these are going to be much more shielded than these two. These two are much more deshielded because they're next to an oxygen. So just because I have three hydrogens, it doesn't make it equivalent of these three. It's different. Now, these three are equivalent to each other but they're not in the same location as these three. So it's gonna be much more shielded, so I might see that peak roughly around here, and that should be the exact same height as the blue one, because it also has three hydrogens. So three. So that roughly is what the NMR would look like. I'm not gonna worry about the numbers yet, we'll talk about that, but it's kind of like IR, there's rough locations as to where these are, they're not exact, uh, but for right now, I just want you to understand the chemical equivalents, so I want you to understand uh, shielding and deshielding, stuff like that. Okay, so these are equal to, so I'm going to see three different peaks on the NMR because there are three different chemically equivalent hydrogens. Make sense? Y or N? Say yes or no. Okay. Good. Okay. So. Oh, what the fuck's happened? What was that? Was that by accident? I think that was a loop. I think you accidentally like, turned on your uh, volume. Okay, so, um, yep. Oh, it was Garrett. Okay. No problem. Okay, let's look at another problem. Uh, and this is a classic type problems that you might see on exams and stuff like that. It's like CH2, it's for oxygen, and CH3. Okay. What I want you to do is tell me how many different peaks on the NMR you'll see for this molecule, or how many chemically equivalent hydrogens are there. Okay, so imagine I have, the, I have an NMR. And, and remember, every different environment, or how many environments are there? That might sound better. How many different environments are there on this molecule? Or how many different peaks would I see on the NMR? So I'll give you a few, mi a few seconds to do that. I gotta do it quick because I, I, we still have so much to talk about. If you can believe we already talked about a lot already. All right, I got four, four, I got a four. The four is the one with the question mark, the four. Jacob, so Kelly, Morgan, Ashley say four. Anna says five. Anybody else want to chime in? Xander says five. Good, I'm glad uh, I know you guys are participating. Obviously, one group of you is right, and the other group of you is wrong. But you're, you're thinking about it. You're doing it. All right, so let's talk about this. All right, let's look at different environments. Okay, so again, the NMR is not smart. It's going to look for hydrogens in the exact same locations versus ones that are not in the exact same location. Okay, so we have to look at to see if there's anything other or a different environment. So let's first start with this methyl group down here. Let's do this in blue. Okay, let's talk about this one. The question is, is there any other hydrogen that's in the exact same location as this? We're talking exact, same number and in the same location, meaning attached to an oxygen in which the oxygen is attached to the CH2, CH, CH3, and CH3. The answer is no. This is the only three hydrogens in this exact environment. 
Okay, here I have a methyl group and here I have a methyl group, but these are attached to carbon. So these are going to be relatively shielded. This is going to be relatively de-shielded. So these will not be near each other on the NMR because this will be relatively de-shielded. All right, and I'll give you an idea. These hydrogens roughly show up around three-ish, around the three area. We're going to talk more about it when we get to this slide. Actually, I can start talking about this slide now. But if you look at hydrogens right here that are next to halogens or oxygens, they're roughly three to four, in the range of three to four. Okay, so I'll start doing that now since we're, we're talking about it. So somewhere between three to four. All right. Now here I have a CH2. Is there any other hydrogen on this molecule that is a CH2 that's attached to an oxygen? The answer is no. This is one of its kind. It's the only type. Now, this methyl group is attached to an oxygen, just like this is, so wouldn't these, wouldn't these be in the same environment? Not the exact same environment. They'd be close. This, these, will be, uh, these are also de-shielded, but I only have two hydrogens, plus they're attached to a carbon. So this carbon has a, has a different effect on these hydrogens than just a methyl group that has nothing else attached to it. So this also would be somewhere between 3 and 4. Like, this might be at like 3.2, and this one might be like at 3.6. Okay, so that's what it might be on the NMR. They'll be close, but they're not exactly the same. All right, now what about this hydrogen? This hydrogen is on a carbon that's attached to methyl groups and a CH2. Is there anything that's exactly like this? No, there is not. This is a different uh, type of environment. So, and then this is more shielded. These show up around one. So uh, non-polar shielded hydrogens show up roughly around one. If you look on, uh, on the chart here, it's like these hydrogens between one and 1.4, all depending on if it's a, a primary, a secondary, or a tertiary. Uh, but I, you don't really have to know that. If you know it's roughly around one uh, to 1.4, you're fine. Now let's look at these methyl groups. The question is, are these methyl groups exactly the same? or are they in different environments? And the answer is they are exactly the same. They are in the exact same environment. This methyl group is attached to this piece, which is a CH with a CH3, a CH2, an O, and a CH3. This hydrogen is in the exact same environment as this hydrogen. So all six of these hydrogens are, the, are in the identical environment. You would see one peak all of those hydrogens. Does that make sense as to why? So all the people who said four, you are correct. The ones that said five, I want to make sure you understand why these are in the exact same environment. They are not, they aren't different. The NMR can't distinguish between these hydrogens and these hydrogens because they absorb the exact same energy. Yeah, I realize halfway through. Okay, right, that's fine. All right. Okay. So you would see four different peaks on the NMR, and these also would be shielded, all right? So it would be, you know, again, around one. So again, where's the exact number? Well, you don't know until you actually do the NMR, but let's say I did this, knowing what we've kind of learned so far, all right? Let's say I have a peak, let's say here, and then I have another peak right here, okay? And then I got a peak here, and then I got another one right there. All right, so let's call this, uh, let's do a different color, let's do a purple. Let's call this A, let's call this B, let's call these methyl groups C, and this little hydrogen here D. Okay, so let's start with this peak right here. This peak right here, which hydrogens would that be for? The A, the B, the C, or the D. This one right there. What do you guys think? Also, notice the size of the peaks. I purposely did different size of the peaks. All right, someone said C. So C would be these hydrogens here, or methyl hydrogens, because does everybody agree with that? Okay, now Kelly says D. And Morgan corrected herself and said, oops, and, and she meant D. Okay, D, correct. It's D, right. Very good, guys, very good. It's D because this is, is showing one-sixth of the size compared to that, right? Because this is representing a much smaller number of hydrogens. 
because depending on how many hydrogens you have, that's how much energy has to be absorbed. So these six hydrogens are absorbing six times the amount of energy compared to that one little hydrogen, right? So that would be for D, what would this hydrogen be? Which one would that be? C, very good, because they're both shielded. Now we're in the D shielded range, all right? So what would the smaller one be, the one at three? Would that be for A or B? D, very good, and this one here, A. Guys, you got it, perfect. I wish NMR is that easy, but we're gonna learn a lot more to it. <laughs> but as long as you understand the placements and understanding integration and understanding all of, of the chemical equivalents, right? I think, uh, I don't remember if it was Ashley or Anna last week, that said that they were watching videos in NMR and how confusing it was. If you don't have someone explaining this, oh yeah, this could be incredibly confusing. But hopefully going over each of these individual steps and understanding shielding and deshielding and how it applies, hopefully it starts to tumble together. I don't expect you guys to just know it all of a sudden. You obviously, I mean, it, you know, it's not like I learned this, oh, I can do every NMR. No, it, it takes practice to kind of keep seeing this stuff over and over again. Okay, so chemical equivalents. Uh, let's actually do a few more of these practice problems. Take three more minutes. All right, I'm going to put a few molecules down here, and I want you to tell me how many different peaks you would see, or how many chemically equivalent hydrogens there are. Remember, we're just looking at the hydrogens. That is what we're looking at. Um, CH3, 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 CH3. Oh, let's see what else. I think I think those are good. Oh, let's just do cyclohexane. All right. Take a few minutes on each molecule. Tell me how many different chemically equivalent hydrogens there are or how many different peaks you would see on the NMR. It's the same thing. Okay? All right. Let me give it. I'll give you some time. Okay, so let's go over this. So let's see, Jacob gave me some answers. Awesome. Um, looks like you guys didn't write, but let's go over these. Okay, so for this one, I uh, gotta remember that there's a hydrogen here. All right. So let's see. These hydrogens are different. This one hydrogen is different. These two are both the same. They're both in the same environment. And then these two are in a different environment, and then we have that one in a different environment. So one, two, three, four. So that'd be five. All right. Um, looks like Jacob said three. I, I I understand why you're saying three because three here, one here, and then all these is one, but they're not really one because these hydrogens are not in the same environment as these hydrogens. These two are next door to a carbon that has a methyl group on it. This is next door to a CH2 that has a methyl group on it, and this is next door. It's two away. So these are not all in the same environment. I mean, this and these are in the same environment of each other, but they're not in the same environment as like, as, why does I keep doing that? As that and that. So does that make sense? Okay. So I, I, I understand where the three came from, um, but it's they're technically not. Now, in reality, I would probably see all five of these exactly in the same place but they wouldn't be exactly in the same place. They would be just shifted off a little bit. All right, this one, let's see, Jacob said two, uh, and that would be correct. So this methyl and this methyl in the same environment, and then all four of these hydrogens are in the same environment, okay? Now, if I had something like this, let's say I had this molecule, let's say an O and a CH3, okay? Technically, there's one, two, three, that would be four environments. And, this, and it's, a, it's the same reason as this, right? These two hydrogens are in the same, but they're different than these two hydrogens here. It's different than that hydrogen there, okay? So the NMR, you can actually determine if something, if molecules are ortho to each other, meta to each other, or para, based off of where they are on our molecule. So NMR is a lot more powerful in that way. All right, and this one, you said five, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, this methyl and this CH2, so pretty much every hydrogen on here are different. These would be equivalent. So I would see five on that one. 
all right? And then on this one, you guys said one. The answer is yes and no. <laughs> I'll talk about why it's yes and no. If you said one, you get full credit. Okay? But in reality, in reality, you actually see two. You see two different peaks for this molecule. Why do you guys think you see two different peaks? This is going to be pretty interesting. Anybody have any idea? You can type it in, or if you want to say it, why do you think they're two different peaks? Each carbon, let's see what Garrett says. Each carbon has two hydrogens. Well, yeah, so yes, you're right. But remember, these, these two are in the same environment, right? And then these two hydrogens are in the same environment, so forth and so on. Okay, so that's why we get the one. Uh, it, so it should be one. That's what it should be. So that is the answer. But in reality, we see two. Okay, so all based off of all the theory, yes, I should only see one, but I see two. Um, so can anybody, anybody else have an idea as to why we see two? Does it have to do with the, stru the structures of the ring? Yes. It does. Go a little bit further. Can somebody come up with a reason why? Uh, can't be resonance, Jacob. Nice try. I, I am assuming you're saying that jokingly because we don't have any pi bonds. So it can't be resonance. And it says chair confirmation. That's exactly right. What about chair confirmation? You see, it does seem to be a common answer if that is the answer. <laughs> that was philosophical there. So yeah, chair confirmation. Why chair confirmation? Remember, cyclohexanes are in chair confirmation. Because we have axial hydrogens and we have equatorial hydrogens, these technically are not in the exact same environments because of the position. Like That's exactly right. So the reason you see two... Stop it, Steve. I cannot type... <laughs> well, that's why you can go off of, the, off of the microphone if you want and just say it. But yeah, so, so so that's exactly right. Uh, I got you have axial and equatorial. So the axial hydrogens will show up at one spot on the NMR, and the equatorial hydrogens will show up at a different spot because technically they're not chemically equivalent. All right, these hydrogens at the axial spot have a different effect because we have these hydrogens. So you remember how we talked about the one three diaxial interaction that these groups are hindering each other. Well, all of these hydrogens, uh, I'm sorry, all these electrons are kind of all hovered around each other. So it makes these hydrogens a, a little bit more shielded. Where these hydrogens are just all sticking out, are kind of naked, uh, they make them a little bit less de-shielded. Um, so that's why on the NMR, you actually see two different peaks. This is how they proved that the, that, that cyclohexane actually exists in a chair conformation, is by, is by analyzing the NMR and knowing that there were two different peaks. Pretty sure that will be on the test. Yeah, it won't be, but that's a good guess. <laughs> it's more, I, it's interesting. It's, it's kind of, I'm trying to bring everything back to why we learn chair confirmations and that it actually is true. It actually exists. Um, you know, because I, I usually have people say, well, how, 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 how do they know it's a chair confirmation? I, I never had that question in this class. Like, how do they know that it exists in the chair confirmation? Well, here's how they know from the NMR. Okay, so that is all of the pre-information we need to know before we start looking at NMRs and analyzing NMRs, okay? So any question up until now? Now I'm going to go through all, all the slides and kind of show how this all ties together and how NMRs look. And then we also have something to talk about called the splitting pattern, which is the, the last thing we'll talk about, all right? Let me uh, do this. Let me get my pen. In case I have to write on here. I hate writing on here, but I gotta do what I gotta do. Okay, these are general locations. Not really something to, you know, really memorize, but kind of understand. Um, this chart, our next chart, is really something that uh, might be more helpful. Um, <coughs> uh, it. On, on the regular exam, what I do is I give everybody this chart, 
so that you kind of have a general idea as to where everything is. Um, but I'll just kind of go through it pretty quick. Actually, yeah, we'll, we'll just do this. So pretty much all the shielded hydrogens that are uh, not attached to electronegative atoms are roughly around one. All right, so at the lowest spot of the NMR, so roughly around here. So these are the shielded hydrogens. They don't actually have a spot here. Okay. All right, now around two, which is kind of a common area, are hydrogens next to a carbonyl. Now, it doesn't mean if you, if you, if you have a peak at two, that always means a, a hydrogen next to a carbonyl, it implies it. Okay, again, the NMR is not very smart. Just because I have a peak at two doesn't mean that. It could mean it's one of these hydrogens. You have to sometimes be given more information than just assuming that. Like if I give you a formula, okay, and the formula has an oxygen on it, and you have a peak at 2.2, then yes, there's a good chance that you have a hydrogen next door to a carbonyl. All right, it might not be a CH3. It could be a CH2. It could be like something like this, and a CH2 and a CH3. So these hydrogens show up roughly around two, because remember, they're, they're next to a carbon that has an electronegative atom. So that's why they're more de-shielded. Not much more, because it's still I have a nonpolar bond here, but I have an electronegative atom close to it. Okay? And again, just kind of a rough estimate. Okay? Because what do you think would happen if I had a molecule that looked like this? If I had an acid chloride? So I have a methyl group next to a carbonyl, but also this carbon also has a chlorine to it. Do you think these hydrogens are still at 2.1? Right? Obviously, if I'm saying it like this, the answer is no, they're not. Okay? Because this chlorine now has another effect. That's why understanding the more electronegative atoms something's attached to, the more de-shield it's going to be. In fact, these hydrogens might be around in the 3 range. Okay, because they now have more electronegative atoms attached to it. Okay, so you kind of have to still understand uh, shielding and deshielding. It's not always perfect. Not every hydrogen next to a carbonyl is going to be at 2.1. Okay, but for the most part, for the ones that we'll mostly see, yes, that might be true. But sometimes you might not. You might see like something like that. Okay, the um, acetylene hydrogen, we're not going to worry about. We aren't going to see any examples like that. Hydrogens next to electronegative atoms like halogens and oxygens and stuff. We already talked about so 0.4. Double bonds we're not going to worry about. Okay. Aromatic hydrogens, they are in the 7 range. Not many other things are in the 7 range. Very characteristic. If you see hydrogens in that 7 range, aromatic, automatically. You know an IR? You remember it was kind of hard sometimes to see IR? Remember it was at 3,000? If things were to the left of 3,000, it was aromatic. Well, and sometimes those peaks were kind of at the 3,000 or maybe over. And you might be like squinting your eyes like, I don't know, is that aromatic? Well, if you go to NMR and you see peaks at 7, yes, you're aromatic. There's no question about it. If you look at the NMR and you don't, then it's not. So using IR with NMR is what you want to do. Those two things like, together, you can pretty much analyze your compound and prove what compound you have without a doubt. Okay. Um, aldehyde hydrogen shows up between 9 and 10. It's the only thing that's 9 and 10. How else do we look at uh, aldehyde on IR? So I'm trying to correlate IR with NMR. Remember, IR had a special way. It was the fangs. You guys remember those fangs? Sometimes they were easy to see. Sometimes they were hard to see because they kind of were in the aliphatic range. So if you're not sure if you have fangs, look at the NMR. If you have a peak at 9, 9, 10, you have aldehyde. If you don't, then you don't have an aldehyde. And then the hydrogen on carboxylic acids are roughly around the 12 range. Uh, alcohols and amines, like I said, these sometimes you can see, sometimes you, you can't. It just depends on the molecule. Um, you'll have to be given other information to actually tell if you have a hydrogen. Okay? So I did that quickly because this is really the graph that I want you to know, okay? This is very easy to see everything. It's basically this whole thing, all right, in a, uh, uh, in a format like that on, on the NMR, okay? So shielded aliphatic hydrogens are in the one range. Hydrogens next to a carbonyl are roughly in this range, the two to two and a half, all right? Deshielded hydrogens attached to oxygens or halogens or this three to four. 
All right, this double bond we're not going to worry about. Aromatics show up in the 7 to 8 range, and then your aldehyde shows up in 9 to 10, and then your, your carboxylic cell acid is greater than that. Okay, but again, this is for most molecules. What if I had this molecule? This molecule is chloroform. Where do you guys think this hydrogen is going to show up? Just give me a guess. And Anna, I'll give you uh, 15 seconds, okay? Is, is that enough time? I don't want to go too fast for you. Okay. Hey, if you're going to bust my chops, I'll... I'll uh... Okay, so Anna says all, uh, all the way left. Why don't you give me a number, approximate number? And again, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, are we talking 10? Are we talking 6 to 7? Are we talking... Okay, so Anna says 11, okay? That's a good guess. So here is roughly 11. So I got one person. Jacob says about nine. That's good. Anybody else say anything? So normally, a, you know, a hydrogen attached like to a halogen would show up in this range, right? Hydrogen, carbon, and halogen. But now I got three halogens on there. So the question is how much of an effect, if any, will the other two chlorines have on this, okay? Anna and Jacob are on the right track. They're basically saying, hey, we've got more electronegative atoms, so this is hydrogen's gonna be a little bit more de-shielded. Okay, which you're absolutely right. Let's first talk about the 11. So carboxylic acid hydrogen show up at, at, at about 11. Do you think this hydrogen would be acidic like an acid? All right, the answer is probably not. All right, um, just because I got three chlorines here will not make this hydrogen that acidic. Okay, so uh, probably not. Nine is actually a good guess. Actuality, it shows up at about 7.2. Okay, so I mean, I didn't expect you guys to actually get the number, but you guys are right in the fact that it's more de-shielded. And just because this chart says it's supposed to be at three to four, you have to take other things into consideration. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm not saying that you're wrong in any way. In fact, your answers are totally what I expected. Okay, I was figuring one was three, so three would be nine. Yep, yeah, that's a good way to do it. Okay, but it's actually about, like about at 7.2, okay? So yeah, I'm not saying you guys are wrong. I don't want you guys to think that, that I'm judging you. In fact, I think you guys did a really good job at it, okay? All right, but you knew it wasn't still at three and four, all right? That was what I, I was trying to get at, that, that don't rely too much on the numbers itself make sure that you look at the molecule and try to understand what else it is going on, okay? So uh, so here's a case where, you, you, you know, you, that you might see a peak at 7.2 and think, hey, that's got to be an aromatic compound. Well, if, it, if I just have a single peak there, you know, that might make me think, well, it can't really be aromatic because aromatic has other hydrogens, you know, ortho hydrogens and para hydrogens and stuff like that. Um, so I have to be given other information, like if, I had an IR, and in the IR, basically I had aliphatic hydrogens, then that would imply that I don't have an aromatic ring. Okay, so that's the location, rough locations of where these groups are. Okay, uh, basically it's four to five different areas. You have this area for the shielded, you have the hydrogens next to carbonyls, which are very common. You've got the electronegative groups, you have the aromatic, and then you've got aldehyde and then a carboxylic acid hydrogen that sometimes shows up and sometimes it doesn't. So there's really six main locations. Okay, so I think this slide is more helpful than that slide because I don't want you to memorize numbers. I don't want you to know the numbers. Know the general area that things are in. Okay, because at one time, this might be 2.1. It might be 1.9. It might be 2.3. It just all depends on other stuff that's attached to it. Okay, so let's start looking at NMRs. All right, the first thing I want to point out is this little signal peak right here at zero. All right, every uh, sample you have to put in a standard of some sort. That's called it's it's TMS stands for tetra methyl silane. All right, it's basically a silicon with four different methyl groups on it. Silicon is a very um, shielding atom on the NMR. Okay, so all four of these hydrogens show uh, uh, are, are usually the most shielded. It's not like the NMR knows that, okay, this hydrogen has to be exactly at 
whatever, uh, uh, four point three, whatever it is. Okay, all right. It doesn't actually know that. It just knows roughly where these peaks are to each other. All right. So what you do is you put a standard in and tell the NMR, okay, this peak is zero. Now plot everything all based off of knowing that that's zero. That's basically how the NMR works. Okay. The NMR knows roughly how far apart these are from each other, but they don't know where they are on the NMR. Okay, and it knows how far away it is from the TMS peak, but it doesn't know that this is exactly at one, this is exactly at three, and so forth and so on. Okay, so you have to tell the NMR that this peak right here is at zero. Okay. So these three hydrogens, or these nine hydrogens right here, are the most shielded. So that would represent this. And then this peak, which is the hydrogen next to the halogen, which is where we'd see around the three range, is that one right there. Also, this is a total of nine hydrogens. This is a total of two hydrogens. So uh, the peak here is roughly you know, four times this, the size of this. This green line, don't worry about. That is a... a, 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 um, a older way of how to find integration what i'll do is actually i'll actually have a number here basically how you did it is you would measure that and that size and actually get a measurement in centimeters and then you'd measure this line and this line and get a, a measurement in centimeters and you divide them and you get a ratio of them okay but for what, what we'll do i'll just make it easier i'll just tell you this is for two and this is for nine Okay, here's another NMR. Again, just kind of showing you examples. Uh, I want to go through this quickly because there's, uh, I have to talk about something called splitting patterns, which can get pretty complicated too. All right, so this methyl peak, one type of hydrogen on it, and it's going to be attached to an electronegative atom, so it's going to roughly be three, and then these nine are over here. All right. This one is interesting. I want to talk about this. First of all, the most shielded ones, these. These are shielded because they're next door to a carbon, nonpolar bond, so we'll be roughly in, in the shielded range, in the one to one and a half range, all right, which is exactly where I'd find them. Now, look at this. These hydrogens are next to carbonyls, right? Well, remember we said hydrogen next to a carbonyl showed up roughly at 2.1, right? That was back on this chart right here, okay? This right here, 2.1, right? Notice it's showing up at 3.2. Well, why is that 3.2? Why is it not 3.1? That's because it's flanked between two carbonyls. All right, so here's a perfect example is why I don't rely too much on the areas. Understand, hey, we're next to two different electronegative groups. So yes, I'm gonna be roughly in that two range, but because I have another carbonyl, I'm gonna be a little bit higher than what uh, a classic example is. Here, I, I, have, I have the example of 2.1. It's just hydrogens next door to one carbonyl. So it should show up at the 2.1. This is at, what, 2.2 and a half, 2.25, all right? But the fact that I've flanked between two electronegative groups, two carbonyls, it's going to be a little bit higher, okay? So that's why I like that example, all right? This you'll see it's called an offset. The offset means uh, what you do is take the highest number that your chart is showing and then add that many to it. So this peak is actually at 12, which is roughly where hydrogens on carboxylic acid shows. This is a hydrogens next to a carbonyl. So we said that roughly shows up at 2.1. That's exactly where our peak is. Okay. Okay, this is a practice problem. I don't really have time for you guys to do this in class. I usually do. Uh, we usually do this on a lab day, so I have three hours like, like to do the lecture. Uh, so I don't have time, so do this on your own. Okay, basically there are three NMRs. Here's one is A, and the second one is B, the third one is C, and then here are your six possible choices. So see if you can match up the structure with the NMR, okay? So if you do that on your own, just uh, let me know, or maybe like tomorrow we'll have three hours of time to do it. We can go over it tomorrow, okay? But for right now, I want to talk about the, the one last concept of the NMR before we have to leave. So we got about 20 minutes, and I need to talk about this. Okay, any questions up to now before I talk about the very last concept? All 
right, this last concept is called splitting patterns. And this is kind of where I find most students are following everything pretty well, and then it comes a little crashing down. I don't know why. All I'm doing is adding one more concept to it. It's not, it's not like I'm changing anything. Okay, splitting. Okay, as of right now, we've talked about the NMR. We can roughly estimate where the hydrogens are, so the location. Okay, so if it's roughly around one, it's shielded, all right, and those would basically be hydrogens on aliphatic groups. If it's next to a carbonyl, it's a little bit more de-shielded, so roughly two. Um, three or four is where it's directly attached to oxygens, aromatics, or seven. So, so the location, that's kind of what we talked about, okay? So if I have a molecule, let's say CH3, CH2O, and then a CH3, all right, so I know this will be roughly three or four, this will be three or four, and this will roughly be uh, about one, okay? And then we talked about integration. That roughly tells me uh, how many hydrogens are in that location, okay? The third thing is splitting pattern, and this is really where NMR shines above everything else. The splitting pattern tells you the number of, of neighboring hydrogens. It doesn't just like tell you about the hydrogens there, it tells you how many hydrogens are next door. So in the NMR, all right, it's not a single peak. So all the examples I gave you up until now are is a single peak. One peak, one peak. All right? One peak, one peak, one, one, one. But you don't always get that. You sometimes get multiple peaks. So at this 3.4, this is a blow up of th this peak here. It's hard to see, but you see how it's three peaks. There's a bigger peak and then two smaller peaks. And then this one right here, this is the blow up of it. There's five peaks there. So it's the same location. So all these hydrogens are in the same location, yet that peak is split into five different peaks. All right, here's also splitting. All right, this one, this one right here at five, there's a blow up right here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, there's seven peaks. So what in the world does the splitting mean? It tells you how many hydrogens are next door to that hydrogen. So the NMR not only tells me roughly where these are and how many there are, but it will tell me that these hydrogens are next door to three hydrogens. That's what the NMR is going to tell me. It'll tell me that these hydrogens are next door to two hydrogens. This, the splitting of this, is going to tell me we are next door to zero hydrogens. And that's what splitting does. So it really gives you a backbone, like the structure of the molecule. It starts telling you, yes, you have a CH2, but where is that CH2? Oh, it's next door to an oxygen, and it's next door to a methyl group. Okay? And it's based off of the splitting. It's called an N plus 1 rule. Okay? And the N plus 1 rule is confusing, but here is basically how it works. If you have a single peak, a singlet, these hydrogens are next door to zero hydrogens. Okay? N plus 1 means N means the number of neighboring hydrogens. Numbering of neighboring hydrogens plus one, all right? That equals my, uh, my peak signal. So if, so if I have a, a single peak signal, all right, so that means this equals one, what does my n have to be? It has to be zero, because zero plus one equals one, all right? So a singlet means there are zero neighboring hydrogen. So this peak, that methyl group, We'll have an integration of three. I'll start writing out the NMR of this. So this will sh roughly show up around three to four. And it's going to have an integration of three. And since there's zero hydrogens next door, it's going to be a singlet. So that's what it's going to look like. And it'll have an integration of three. So there's always three pieces of information you get from every peak. You get the location. Okay, it's at three, so I know it's next door to an oxygen. I get the integration. There's three hydrogens. Finally, I get the I call it the splitification, just because it's all because all these end in shun. 
location integration splitification, though it's not a word, but it's just kind of funny. I then look at the splitting pattern to tell me what is next door to it, and what's next door to this is something that has zero hydrogens. So what is that going to be? So it's at three and no hydrogens, it's going to be an oxygen. So yes, I gave you the structure of the molecule, but what if you didn't have the structure of the molecule? And you saw a peak like this. You would know it's a methyl group because it's three hydrogens. It's attached to an oxygen or a halogen because it's roughly at the 3.4. And it's next door to zero hydrogens. Okay? So all we're adding is the splitting pattern. Don't forget anything else. Here's where a lot of people are like, oh my goodness, now, okay, the splitting is next door to it. Okay? So don't forget about these two things. I spent like an hour and 20 minutes just talking about these two. Now we're adding splitting to it. All right, if I have a doublet, this is called a doublet, how many hydrogens are next door to something that's a doublet? Just put the number in there. Right, one, exactly. This would be one hydrogen. It's a doublet. Remember, it's the N plus one rule, okay? So uh, remember, it's N plus one, in this case, equals two, because it's a doublet. However many peaks I have is what my answer equals. So my n is 1. All right, it's always 1 less than how many peaks you have. So if you have 1 peak, it's 1 less than that. It's 0 hydrogens. 2 peaks, it's 1 hydrogen. The other way of doing it is if you count how many valleys there are. This only has 1 valley, so it's 1 hydrogen. This has 0 valleys, so it's 0. That's another way of doing it. But really, it's based off of the n plus 1 rule. However many peaks, subtract 1 from that number of peaks. Okay? These will also roughly be the same size. They might not be exactly the same size, but they'll be close. Then I have a triplet. How many neighboring hydrogens does a triplet have? Two. Exactly. All right. This, so if you guys are, you, if you're good at math, remember math, there's something called the Pascal's triangle. Uh, that's basically what these are based off of, is that I have a peak in the middle. These two peaks should be half the size of the middle peak. So if anyone has done a Pascal triangle stuff, if you haven't, don't worry about it. It's not really that important. Uh, but if you're a math person, all right. Then we have a quartet. Quartet looks like that, where you have two that are the same size, and then these two are half the size, but they are the same size of each other. That would be for three peaks. That's a quartet. We have a pentet. Which would look like that. This one's bigger. This one is, is half the size of the big one. These are half the size of those over there. This would be for four, and then so forth and so on. Okay, here's what a sextet would look like. That's supposed to be a little bit smaller. That'd be for five, and so forth and so on. Okay, so for practice, why don't you analyze these two types of hydrogens? Tell me roughly where they would be the location, tell me the integration, and then tell me what the splitting pattern would be. I'll give you guys just like maybe two or three minutes because I want to go over some problems. Okay? Okay, so these hydrogens here, the location is three because it's next to the oxygen, integration of two, but it's split into four peaks because it's next door to three peaks. Remember, the number of peaks is always one more than how many it's next door to. These, location is about one, so roughly around here. It's going to have an integration of three, and it's next door to two hydrogens, so it's going to be a triplet. Okay, so let me actually write this out a little bit better. But basically, this is what it's going to look like. Let's call this one, call this two, call this three, call this four, five. So the NMR is going to look like, well, that's supposed to be one. Singlet and then a quartet. And this will be a three, this will be a three, and this will be a two. Okay? So I know the splitting gets confusing because it's always one more, one less. Like, how do I go? Is it one more or one less? Um, so that's, that's how that works. Any questions on that? 
I want to go over some examples before we leave for today. Um, don't just not look at this after today. I would at least maybe later this evening re-look at it. I know this is a lot. I know uh, on the days I do this in lab, it, we really do spend the three hours. I mean, we take up the whole three hours. People are brain dead and just like, oh my God, that's so much stuff. And I tell people, give yourself a break. Look at it again later this evening and then look at it in the morning. And then by that time, you'll pretty much have all digested it. So tomorrow, hopefully, um, we probably will use the full three hours for tomorrow. So I want to make sure we do everything. Okay, so let's look at some of these examples real quick, just to kind of show you how, how the splitting works. Okay, so here is the molecule. Okay, we have the A hydrogen. So these B hydrogens are equivalent because they're both ne next to bromines. So there's four hydrogens. Now, this sometimes is, is what the NMR does. I'm not going to do this. But the NMR shows ratios of the hydrogens. They don't necessarily always show the number of hydrogens. Again, the NMR is not that smart. It just knows that there is a 2 to 1 ratio of these hydrogens. Okay, right? Because it's 4 and 2. Uh, right? So the ratio is 2 to 1. So the NMR says there are two of these types of hydrogens and only one type of this hydrogen. But in reality, it's a 4 and a 2 ratio. You might see this a few times. Don't get confused by that. I'm not going to do it on the exam. I'll clearly show you how many hydrogens there are. But you might, but they're actually ratios of each other. Okay, so this peak at 3.4 or 3.5 is obviously attached to something electronegative. Okay, it has an integration of 4 and has a triplet. So the triplet means that it's next door to two hydrogens. So the way I would analyze this, let's pretend I didn't have the structure, but I have the formula, which is what you probably will have. The way I analyze this, I always start with the peak most to the left. I'll put a carbon, and I know carbon has to have four things attached to it. All right? Well, I know the formula has a bromine, and this is at 3.5, so I know that this carbon has to be attached to a bromine because it's the most electronegative atom. And it has four hydrogens, so I mean it's got to have two because I have twice the amount. All right, And it's next door to something. I'm Sorry about that big peak, but it's next door to something that has two hydrogens on it. All right, why two? Because this is a triplet. So triplet, remember, it's one less than that. Or count how many valleys. There's one valley, two, there's two valleys. So this one peak gives me this piece of information. All right, now if we analyze this one, this is a carbon with two hydrogens on it. Again, location, all right? And then it has two hydrogens. And then it's split into one, two, three, four, five. So that's four hydrogens. How is that possible? Well, there's two on this side and there's two on that side. So this, all this information tells me I have a CH2 attached to a CH2 attached to a CH2, which is what my molecule has. And then this piece of it tells me that the CH2s over here have bromines attached to them. So by taking the pieces of information, you can kind of piece all together what the structure is. That might have been fast, so you can re-watch re the, uh, the video, or um, maybe you got it. All right, let's do another one real quick. How many more are there? There's a few more. Okay, so let's not look at the structure right now. Let's just analyze it. And I'll tell you that the formula is, let's say, one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, four, C7. H five six seven eight nine ten one two seven fourteen O two. So that's the formula. Let's not worry about the structure. So I'm going to start the most left peak. Okay. So I start. I always write a carbon with four bonds to it. Why? Because that's organic chemistry. Right. Organic chemistry is carbons, and there's four, there's always four bonds attached to it. I really hate this. Okay, so let's write, so I have to fill in what all these four pieces are, because I'm trying to figure out fragments of my molecule. First, I start with the integration. Remember, integration, I'm sorry, first, yeah, let's start with integration first, then location, then splitification. Okay, integration, there's one hydrogen, so this carbon has one hydrogen on it. That's the integration. Next thing, location, it's five. Attached to something really de-shielded. So what in my molecule 
is going to make this hydrogen very deshielded? Well, it's obviously the oxygen, right? So this must be attached to an oxygen. How do I know this is? How do I know this peak is attached to an oxygen? The location and the formula. If I didn't have the formula, I would have no idea. Is it an oxygen? Is it a halogen? Is it a nitrogen? Uh, I would have no idea what it is, but the fact that I'm given a formula will tell me. So I would have to give you a formula and tell you what atom it's attached to. Then I look at the splitting pattern to figure out what these are. I don't know what's attached to the oxygen. More information will be telling me that. Okay. So I look at the splitting pattern. Now, it looks like I have one, two, three, four, five. Now, what if we eat these two little tiny ones? Do you think that's part of it? The answer is yes. If you have two peaks that are exactly the same size at the exact opposite ends, those are peaks. Remember the Pascal triangle analogy I was giving you? Like, if you look at something like this, you see the blow up here, I got a little peak right there. That is not a peak because I don't have the same one on this side. I have to have the exact same size. Same thing here. See, I, don't, I have two little peaks here, but I don't have them here. So those are not peaks. All right. You have to have uh, exact same size, exact same peak on the opposite side. So those are peaks. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is seven peaks. So that means there are six hydrogens next door. So how can this hydrogen have six hydrogens? Well, the only possibility is a CH3 here and a CH3 there. So this one peak gave me all of this information because, again, go down this list every time. Look at the integration first. Put how many hydrogens there are. Look at the location. This is five. Attached to something very de-shielded. In this case, it happens to be the oxygen because that's all I have on my molecule. Next is the splitting pattern. That tells me what the other groups are. So, I, so from this one peak, I've analyzed half of my molecule. Okay. So then I go to the next peak. Let's go to this peak at 2.2. So always draw a carbon with four bonds. Draw two hydrogens. Why two hydrogens? Because that's the integration. You can draw them anywhere. It's not really important where you draw them. Location. Okay, 2.2. What shows up at the 2.2 range? All right. 2.2 was hydrogens next to a carbonyl. Okay. So let's start looking at my molecule. Well, one of my oxygens has been accounted for by... Uh, directly attached to it, but I have a second oxygen. So you know what? Most likely, that's a carbonyl. Okay? So the fact that this is at 2.2 is implying I have a carbonyl. Does it mean every peak at 2.2 is a carbonyl? No. But the fact that I have a second oxygen available and we're at 2.2 is implying I probably have a carbonyl. Now, the IR would tell me for certain that I have a carbonyl. And then the fact that this is split into a triplet, you can see there's one peak here, two peaks here, and two peaks there. That means this is attached to a CH2. So this gives me this portion of my molecule. Okay? And then I keep analyzing them. I have this one. This has two. I got, I got to hurry up here. I got two hydrogens. It's roughly at one point something, so that's pretty shielded. So it's probably just attached to a bunch of carbons and hydrogens. This is, you'd have to look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's six, so that's five. So a CH3 and a CH2. And then this tells me six hydrogens. How is it possible to have six? Well, it's these hydrogens. The, that three and that three are equivalent. Six, and it's a doublet, so it's next door to one. So I have all the fragments. Now you piece them all together. All right, realize I have a CH2, CH2. That overlaps with these two. And so that means I have a CH3 on this side. And there's an oxygen with my CH and my CH3s. Now, I know this was quick, guys. I know this was quick. Some of you might have been following it. But this is basically how you do this. The more you practice, the better you will get at this. You start at the most left, do this thing, put a carbon with four bonds, and start filling in information that you're given. Like if it's more de-shielded, I must have an oxygen. If the integration is one, the splitting pattern now tells me everything I have on top of there. Okay, uh, let me take Anna's question real quick. Uh, on to take home worksheet for this. Will the peaks be big enough? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep, it'll be very clear. Um, define visiting the NMR practice links you have posted. Uh, if you go on, the, uh, on D2L, you'll find them.
Uh, like the splitting section, like the splitting sections on the, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, if, if, uh, I, I'm going to check after this and see, uh, if those problems are posted, if they're not, I will post them. Um, uh, otherwise, um, there are problems in your book that you can always do any of the NMR problems. You can always go online and do practice NMR problems. Make sure that, that they have the answers, but uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll post stuff pretty soon. Okay? All right. All right, guys. I, I got to get going. I'll talk to you later. I'll make sure I get everything there.